Welcome to Dispatches from the Front as we rejoin David Scott in his extraordinary interview with Brian and Janice Doherty, the couple who lost their children, stolen by social services, stolen by the state as a result of reporting the actions of a paedophile. David Scott here sitting down again with Janice and Brian Doherty. Uh, covering the story of uh, flight from the authorities uh, in Scotland after reporting a paedophile in the local community and finding that uh, the police and social services sided with the perpetrator and not with the innocent family. Uh, their story is taking them to Ireland um, to, to seek, firstly, safety. Uh, for themselves and particularly for their children and um, we'll pick the story up there um, when you first reached Ireland um, well, where did you head to? We, um, well, I booked a holiday home um, down in Tipperary it was just for a week um, and we thought in that week we'd, we'd have time to contact the, the government and um, and inform them of the corruption by police and social services. Yeah, um, we booked a holiday home just for a week in Tipperary. It was really just a case of what was immediately available for reasons of safety. So we booked a place which we'd never heard of before in County Tipperary called Nena, um, a wee village just outside Nena called Pocane, where there was a holiday home available. And it was that simple really. We didn't really, it was, although it was a holiday home, it wasn't really a holiday in the normal sense of the word. It was a case of find somewhere safe and somewhere available. So that was it. We booked it online, or Janice booked it online, and we arrived on the 5th of September. And uh, at what point did you have any official involvement with your family again after that? We, um, we remained in contact with Police Scotland and Social Services. Um, the holiday home was supposed to have email, but like many holiday homes, they didn't live up to the billing and they didn't have internet access. So I was going along to a local car garage and contacting both police and social services to demand what basis are they persecuting and attacking our family. Um, and at the same time, we were trying to put together information to send to the government. But it was approximately the last night of our holiday home stay on the 12th of September when two Garda showed up at the holiday home at 10pm at night. 10pm in the evening? 10pm, yeah, it was 10pm at night, um, on a Friday night. Um, we got a knock on the door, it was pitch black outside. I opened the doors and there was two Garda, and they both stepped back and put their hands up as if I was a dangerous individual um, who was a threat to them. And they said, look, we don't want any trouble, we just want to come and see the children okay. And I said, that's fine, I, I don't know, that, no problem, Taki, what's this about? And he said, are you Mr Doctor? I said, yep. I am. Um, can we see your children? I said, sure. So they came into the holiday home. They looked yeah. at the children. Saw the children. Lottie showed them our guinea pigs. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and they said obviously there was. They thought they were, you know they were quite happy. There was obviously no problems. Um, so we asked them what this was about, why they turned up, and they said that they'd been contacted by Interpol, um, and that Interpol had located us through my bank details because I paid paid for the holiday home um, using my bank card. At um, that point. Um, I, Janice and I started to tell them what had really happened back in Scotland and you could see the face change and, and the, the colour change in their face, they went, they went pallid. They'd just been told by the local their superintendent to go and check on us and they were told it was Interpol that had recommended this. Yeah, we'd been marked down as an extreme case, uh, We'd been urgent marked case. An, under the Scottish government terms as an extreme case and when they came and checked upon the kids they said there was no problem. When we were outside talking to them and just outside the house, um, they said they, didn't, they, they couldn't be involved, they didn't want to be involved. they just come to check and report back that we were here. They'd identified us and that everything was okay. The children were fine. They, could, they said they could see the children were calm and relaxed and there was no issue. Um, I said to them that actually this was dangerous and we needed some kind of help and they didn't want to help us. I asked them how they managed to find us and they said it was Interpol. And... Um, I says, well, how did you manage to locate us? Because we're only on holiday. I mean, how do, you know, we, we're, we're here on holiday for a week. We're supposed to be returning home tomorrow. We've come here to try and send information to our government. How would you... I mean, it's not normal when you're on holiday to be visited by the Garda. And he says, well, Interpol located you through your bank records. 
Now, later, almost 10 months later, I did a Freedom of Information with Interpol and they said they had no record of us on our database. And Interpol denied that they had been utilised by Police Scotland to track us. So this was in, factually inaccurate when I contacted Interpol and Leon through an FOI. Okay. Did you ever get any indication as to how they did find you? Later in court, it was told we, we were believe it was the National, National Crime, Crime Agency. Agency. Because Interestingly enough, the agency who I'm first contacted um, to, report to report to, they would not only supply us, they refused to give us information from the subject access request and they stated that they weren't applic- this, the freedom of information and the subject access laws were not applicable to them. The chief um, operations officer at that time was a man called Phil Gormley, who later became later that year the Chief Constable of Police Scotland. And when the second attack happened to my family was when he became... Just before, just before when he Police became, Scotland didn't have a Chief Constable. So it was an unusual period of one month in December 2015 when Police Scotland didn't have a Chief Constable and he had been lined up. Interestingly, he was the outsider for the job at Chief as Police Scotland. He was the third of three candidates and the only external candidate and he was the one that got the job. And I, I have already complained to Perk about his particular involvement against my family. Okay, so these two these two guard officers turn up late at night. Um, apparently, everything's fine. Um, you were already planning to leave. So, what what happened? What happened next? Well, because of the clearly the corruption was off the chart. I mean, when you're told you're an extreme case, um, you've gone from reporting a paedophile to being located by Interpol being, as far as you're aware. You're on you're on holiday trying to contact your government because within of, six weeks you've gone from reporting a paedophile to being allegedly reported by or followed by Interpol. So yes, it's quite a it's quite, that's quite it's a, a bit scary. Journey. Yes. <laughs> I actually lost my voice um, when those officers left. I lost my voice, my throat went very hoarse, and it was just an instant reaction to the strain of what we could see was extremely corrupt. Well, I said at that point that it's not safe to stay here, we've got to leave. If they're turning up in, at 10 o'clock at night, there's and, and we're supposed to leave the next morning anyway, then, then I don't think there's an agenda, and I don't think it's, it's, it's safe, safe for us. They're not turning up um, to locate us at this time for nothing, especially when we're due home the next day. So um, we packed the car there and then, put the children in the car, and we just, we didn't have anywhere to go, but we, we started driving. We'd already seen that holiday homes in a place called Achel, um, up in County Mayo, were, were cheap. So we thought, right, we don't have much money, and <laughs> we don't have anywhere to go, and it's still tourist season, so we'll head there and we can it was see if we can find a, a, a place it's still to stay. Very much tourist season to the end of September, so we looked for um, somewhere available and somewhere cheap and went headed towards. County Mayo in Ackle where it was quite cheap. Okay, so you, you, you get you get a place you get somewhere to stay in Ackle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um and um you you then have to contact you need you need funds. You can't contact a bank, is that right? Yeah, um We managed to survive um on very little actually for a wee while. We managed to survive in that and um in that time we were writing up statements about the level of corruption um, back in Scotland. So, so, so this is a dossier detailing your experience of the previous six weeks and, and interaction with social work and... Social stuff. services. And exactly what happened with the, the paedophile, with other people, the Viscount, with the police officers and social workers. Detailed complaints, detailed statements my wife and I put together. For reasons so of safety. We didn't use the internet, we didn't have mobile phones, and we didn't use our, our bank cards or any cards at all at that point. We didn't use any of them. But when we ran out of money, um, my wife, we used a, we had a small phone from Tesco. I bought, yeah, bought a new phone with cash and phoned the Nationwide, phoned the nationwide to find out Skillin, where which was the nearest branch. Well, we, we were just to find out where there was the nearest branch, because we didn't know Ireland. there aren't any in the Republic. So um, that was the end of November. We'd sent all the report to the, the, the British government at, in mid-November and they'd had to send it up to Scotland um, because it was a devolved matter. End of November, we were forced to, to go up to the bank. And, right, so, um, so, that's a, so you've sent a full dossier on all of these, all of, all of these events yes. and that's gone to both the UK government and then subsequently to the devolved administration in Holyrood. We, we send that to the UK government and then they, they were obliged because it was a crime matter, it was a devolved matter, it was sent to the Scottish government 
And what later transpired in court is that within a matter of days, our detailed dossier of various documents, maybe about 15 documents de- spanning 77 pages, was sent by the Scottish Government within a matter of days. This was a dossier detailing social work, senior social work officer, including director and area manager corruption and senior police officer corruption. The Scottish Government took that dossier and gave it to the very same people in senior positions of Police Scotland and Aberdeenshire Council. And they took this information and incredibly, as was revealed by a promoted officer for Police Scotland on the 2nd of February 2015, the Scottish Government orchestrated an international task force with the Irish Government. So, the Scottish Government passed the dossier detailing your, your accusations, your experiences, mm-hmm. to the very people who were accused of being corrupt. Exactly. So, we, we detailed statements um, which gave a very blow-by-blow factual sworn account of who said what, who said what when, what they said and what we said and exactly what transpired, dates, details, the whole lot and And the Scottish Government. So rather than supporting a family under threat by corrupt people within the administration, what you see, would you describe it as as, um, Scottish Government circling the wagons? Was was it, were you in the outside or uh, or how would you uh, looking back on it now, how would you sort of characterise what happened there? Because that, again, in parallel to what you, to your experiences in Aberdeenshire, that would be the reverse, obviously, of what you what you were looking for. The reverse of what the average man in the street would expect of the Scottish government uh, in response to someone raising serious allegations of criminal wrongdoing uh, against senior officials. Like it goes back to who do you contact um, when the police and social worker are, are behaving in such a dangerous fashion? When they're acting criminally. They're acting criminally. Who do you contact when the, when the police are behaving criminal? We didn't expect work? the government to then act criminally as well. We didn't expect <laughs> the government to put our lives in danger further. Set and up a task force with the intention our children of, of in danger. removing our children. And we came, up, we came through in court on the 2nd of February, quite incredibly, through a Detective Sergeant McDougall, was that... When the Scottish Government received our information, they had, between the end of November and the mid-January period, that six-week period, they had four meetings with our counterparts in Ireland, so Police Scotland with the Irish Garda and Aberdeenshire Council with Irish Social Services, had four meetings over a fortnightly period, starting in the beginning of December and ending in mid-January, where they had this task force, an international task force, with a specific goal of removing our children and sectioning my wife and I in a mental health course. Right, okay. Um, We'll we'll, we'll come uh, in due course to the the assaults on your children and the attempts to uh, have you sectioned. Um, Some of the people who might be listening to this might find that impossible to believe. Others who have either lived through it or have heard similar accounts will find it only too familiar. Um, the use of mental health services as a way of attacking and undermining people. Um, the, the use of child protective services as a way of targeting families is something which um, I, maybe 10 years I wouldn't have believed and, I, and I'm now only, only too familiar with because it's a story that is so often repeated. Um, to, to go back just to the narrative, you, you, you said you contacted the, the nationwide and headed up to Inniskillen to get some essential funds. Yeah. What what happened when you reached Inniskillen? Well, there was yeah. a, a man standing outside the bank, um, and not very subtly um, watching us. And we were actually in Inniskillen for less than an hour because it was a long journey to get there and a long journey home, and we did it in the one day. It wasn't like we had the money for a hotel or anything. So we bought so, a, a, quite a, a cheap phone from Tesco and Janus phone to well, phone banking, and two days previously, and after we withdrew funds, went up there was a nation. chap waiting outside who then followed us all the way down from Inniskillen down 200 to miles Castle to Bar in Castle County Bar. Mayo. And it's a single road from Castlebar, eh, sorry, from Enniskillen along to, to Sligo. And this car was behind us every step of the way. 
And it, you might, a part of me was thinking maybe it's just a coincidence. The car continually followed us then to County Mayo. And the man followed us round the Tesco in Castle Bar, most unsubtly. <laughs> Where he was actually following us, actually, literally, you know, a few metres just behind us, watching what we were doing and what we were buying. And um, and that was then confirmed in December 2015, 2015. at the court hearing on the 21st, when um, social the social worker. worker Mary Malee said that that was how we were located. We were folded from Enniskill and down to Castle Bar. How a police. social worker would be aware of that is quite revealing in terms of the, the, the kind of unholy collaboration between these two. But um, between this period of early December and mid-January, there was a massive amount of surveillance, housebreaking, um, monitoring, following us about when we were either going shopping, there was housebreaking when we were at church or out shopping, or anywhere at all for that matter. Um, there were cars following our family. There was a, a car we reported, which um, when we were doing our business outside, we were shopping, there would be people following us. Um, this was reported to... Um, and uh, uh, the government, and there was no feedback from it, there was no action to it. So you've got um, ongoing surveillance admitted in court. Mm -hmm. You have high-level contacts, a regular and repeated contacts between senior government officials in Aberdeenshire, Scot Scottish government and Irish government um, admitted in court. Um, so you, you're, you're being the, the centre of something. Was, during this time, was there any formal accusations against you of anything that, that would be either criminal wrongdoing or neglect or anything that would warrant even part of that? We never heard anything from anybody. No, we were never. Nobody accused us of anything. Nobody got in touch with us. In um, fact, in in September, I received an email from an, an inspector coroner in Police Scotland when we were staying in the holiday home. On the tenth of September, um, and I can show you this email and forward this to you. Inspector coroner says you're not being accused of anything. We just want to. We just like to report to the US police station. We just want to know your children are okay. And we want to know your address. And we want to know your address. We'd like to send somebody to visit you. What later transpired in court as well is that um, there was contradictory statements between police and social services. The police said we fled after our holiday home because the Garda officers had said that we had to report to social services the next morning. On the Monday morning. The, guard, the social services people said they weren't contacted by social services in Scotland until the Monday morning. So there was lots of inconsistencies. But the, the Garda in Nina, um, their report doesn't mention anything about social services and, and it, that was just um, something there was other um, inconsistencies about invented it. later to try and make it seem as if we'd, we'd fled from, from Nina um, because the Garda, it's not even in their report, they didn't refer to that either. Um, it was so one of these recurring motifs. It was just motifs. invented. Yep. It was a recurring motif which was that we were fleeing like we were criminals, international terrorists who were fleeing justice. So, so yes. you're, you're not accused of anything? We never were never accused, accused of anything. anything. So at what point does fleeing, <laughs> does travelling become fleeing? Fleeing, yes, quite. Well, it just suited the agenda because the agenda, it, it, there's a, a massive difference between um, us leaving a dangerous situation in Aberdeenshire to contact our government. On a holiday? On I a mean, holiday. It was, we did just book on a that, holiday. On, wasn't that, like, on that basis, um, they would actually send in the poll after millions of British people every year who went on holiday. <laughs> we were not accused of anything, and there was nothing alleged. Far and Quite the opposite. We'd already alleged a person in Aberdeenshire. So we're, so we're seeing here, um, it's... it's uh, Accusation by inference. You know, we use we use the word fleeing to suggest there's a crime, mm -hmm. but there's no crime. Yeah, that's right. right. We use the word concern. We use the word safety to suggest that there's a child safety issue, but there's no child safety issue. Quite. It's it's all this sort of by inference. It was um, linguistics to justify a horrendous illegal campaign because we dared to report a paedophile who was well connected. So you um, continue through your Enniskill in what, mid-December? End of November. End, End of November. November. Um, you, can, you continue living in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, do you can 
Do you continue to make any further reports to the Scottish government or the UK government? We sent a, a, a large dossier of maybe 15 different letters and reports. Well, that was mid-November. We didn't send anything we further. We didn't send anything further. Nothing else after that. No. So what's the next major event then that, that occurred? The next major 20th event was of the January. 20th of January. A number of vehicles show up at our house without any prior About warning or contact. 8 o'clock in the morning. ATM. There was um, a thump thumping on the door. You opened the door and four policemen and two social workers burst in, shoved you physically backwards across the floor. Um, the two, of, two of them were armed, part of an armed response unit. And they'd been sent up from or down from Galway. Yeah. And, uh, and just started shouting. There's a lot of shouting. <laughs> so really. this is happening in Mayo? Um, yeah, it's in, in Ackland Mayo. In Ackland, in Ackland Mayo. And uh, it was very loud, it was very aggressive. It was the, the officer who kept shoving, shump, uh, shoving me um, was pumped up. And um, then they divided the family and the armed officer stood over Janice and the children and two of the social workers and the two local police officers took me upstairs to the living room and denied me access to a lawyer. Um, we actually repeatedly throughout that day refused access to a solicitor. Did they give you any court documentation to justify that this action was in any way lawful? They didn't actually have anything at that point. They didn't have a single... They didn't give us anything. But what they did tell us was that the Irish Constitution didn't apply to us and that we had no... Legal rights. Legal rights. They said that um, the, the officer kept shouting, you are not going to get a solicitor. If you're going to waste time, if you're going to... I said, look, nothing here has been done properly and above board. We are, we are, we've reported criminality here and you're attacking us. They my just fa- kept shouting fa- and they wouldn't listen at they, all. They weren't, they weren't interested in listening. They were, this was not a, a situation where it, it was clear that the agenda from the start was just to win literally guns blazing. And, <laughs> well, not um, quite literally, but it could have been. <laughs> it could have been. And um, we, um, we were told, look, either you come with us now and we'll do an assessment. I said, look, Nothing that's been done back in Scotland is legal or fair. And they said, look, no, we all disregard everything that's happened in Scotland. If you come with us now, we'll do an independent assessment. But if you don't, we'll go to the court judge and we'll get an emergency care order and we'll put your children in care now. So with um, a choice of a rock and a hard place um, and a lot of shouting and cajoling, we got the children dressed and we were divided up into a fleet of vehicles. So, so essentially and legally... Although there was clear and obvious coercion, um, bullying, armed response, and all the rest of it, they were relying on your voluntary compliance at that point because they had no court order. There was no paperwork. Yeah, there was no legal. So, um, we were then. The children were. I was told that I said we're not going into a car unless the children are with either me or my husband, and I was I was told that the, the that um, my husband would, would be in the car with the girls, I'd be in the car with the, the, the boys, we would be driven. And after I was in the car with the two boys, they then put the two girls in a car with a social worker and they wouldn't let you in, you had to drive yourself. Mm. So I was promised that the children would be with us and mm. instead they took the two girls separately and they um, grilled them the journey, which was about an hour's journey. And they kept asking the girls questions and trying to put words into their mouth. And trying to get them to, to, to see things. And at the same time, um, the the lead social worker, a social worker called Mary Malee, promised my wife and I that there'd be an independent assessment done and it would be done fairly. And that if we just came with them just now, we'd be back by midday. She promised to be yes. back by lunchtime. If everything we said was true, they would get the paediatrics to do a report. They just wanted to check over the children. If you've got nothing to hide, come with us now. Otherwise, we've got a court order. And at the same time, it was that Machiavellian that she immediately went with her manager. In her brand new British registered Vauxhall Astra, which she had only just received that morning. A brand new car, which she barely knew how to operate. A brand new British registered car. And she immediately went to the judge in Ballina, um, which was another hour away and got a court order for an emergency, emergency court care order. order. That was before they'd even conducted any assessment of Any their basic own. assessment. So, so it, was, it was basically complete lies. Yes, so everything you were told to pursue. So your voluntary compliance, if, if that's what they were legally standing on when they actually took your children into their custody, mm. your voluntary compliance um, was uh, acquired by threats and by lies, yes. by misrepresentation. Yes. Totally, totally. Okay. Um, now, 
um, the so this, this this you were transported into Castle Bar. Was that was that to a, a police station, a hospital? Yeah, a hospital. Yeah. That's Inda Kenny's constituency is Castle Bar, the Taoiseach in Ireland. Now we come from the First Minister's constituency in Aberdeenshire, and between these two countries, there was an international task force between Scotland and Ireland, with this explicit goal of sectioning my wife and I. The next um, underhanded trick that was used was that it went from saying that if you just come with us, we'll do an independent assessment, to um, telling us that if we just went to a psychiatrist, um, we've got concerns about your mental health, repeating over that there's some kind of paedophilic activity, we've got concerns about your mental health. If you just go and see a doctor or a psychiatrist... Well, we had to see a, they, they told us that we had to see a, a, a GP and she would assess our mental health and um, and if everything was fine... That would be that, would get the children back and, and that would be the end to it. Um, but it turned out, at the, this GP's own admission, that she'd already arranged to, to refer us to a psychiatrist. Right, so it's not any longer about the welfare of the children per se, well, or whether they're healthy or, or, or... They conducted their own assessment after they'd already got the emergency care order and the paediatrician said they were all very healthy and well and at appropriate stages and they, they conducted an interview with the two girls and said they had no problems. They said they were taking our children into care but their own assessment had been positive. It, they were taking the children into care based entirely on the notes from, from Aberdeenshire which they had promised us that morning they would disregard. Completely Scotland. So in other words, at the beginning of that day she said that there'd be an independent assessment this social worker, Mary Lee, and she immediately went, and at 10.30 that morning, before the assessment had completed at 1pm, she got an emergency care order, and then having said there was going to be an emergency, sorry, an independent assessment, she then said to us that, yes, your children have passed all the reports, and they're healthy and well-nourished, etc., etc., but we're going to put your children in care based on information from Scotland. Well, the other thing, what the other does. thing worth mentioning is that she told us that the entire social work department in Castlebar had been cleared for three days to process our family. An entire department of 22 social workers and other staff were cleared and she told us, and I quote, our family was the number one priority. That's the phrase she so repeated. you've gone to Ireland initially on a holiday. There are no welfare concerns to do with either the uh, mental condition or physical condition of your children. Um, the only concern is concern raised in writing from from Scotland, from Aberdeenshire. And that's enough to clear 21 social workers for three days just to look at your family. Yep, so it would seem... 22 social workers, um, I know that's just for a pedantic reason, but the other thing that, that happened that day, David, just to show you just what the agenda was, because effectively our children were kidnapped, and our kill children were kidnapped with the goal of holding them to ransom till my wife and I were sectioned. And when we went to see Dr O'Malley... Which was the Thursday, the following day. The following day... The next carrot by the social work team was that they would let us see the notes, which they never did, and that they would clear this whole thing up right now. They said, what we'll do is if you go and see this, this doctor and she says you're healthy, then we'll give your children back. That's what she said. So it's all hanging on these notes from Scotland. The only evidence against you at all mm. is these notes from Scotland and these notes you've, you've not actually physically seen even to in two years no we no. have never seen them um, did you find out anything about them we well, did really. I've, I found out from uh, Dr Brigio Mali um, during her so called assessment of our mental health that um, that there was a report in there from a health visitor in Aberdeenshire she didn't tell me who it was we later discovered it was a woman named Phyllis Smart and apparently this report stated that my husband's father was a paedophile and he was abusing our daughter Alexandra and that my husband was allowing this. So Brigio that Mali... Some, that, I mean, that would, be a, that would be a very serious um, uh, concern, obviously. I mean, if, if, if that were true, it, you know, did it strike you as odd? I was just absolutely stunned. I just, she said to me, her words were, um, I think, what about your father-in-law? And I said, well, what about him? He's dead. And she said um, that he'd that the note said that he'd abused Alex. And I just, I just 
I said, no, you know, no, goodness, no. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, no. I had been, had he been long dead? Five, about five years, or maybe five three, years. three, four, yeah. five years, something like that. Anyway, quite I a while. Four, 2011, 2015, four years. Right, so. So a health visitor called Phil Smart from Aberdeenshire. From Grampian NHS. Grampian mm-hmm. NHS. Writes a, a document accusing your father, who was dead five years previously. Yeah. Of, of being a paedophile. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that I was putting my daughter at risk because I was in contact with my father and allowing abuse to take place. In contact with your father who died five years previously. Yes. The, so, Somebody is it, and had you ever met Phyllis Smart? Never. never. We'd never heard of None her. None of her never, family's ever met Never met her. And she's never met the children? Never met the children. Just like so, Scotland, never so met children. Have you any idea at all what this could be based on? Well, I did a freedom of information. I've done many freedom of information and of a, about a dozen organisations. Only Interpol has told the truth and actually responded and said that they have no, they've not had um, any involvement in this whatsoever, contrary to what Police Scotland and the Garda told us. Um, Grampian NHS refused to um, give us the subject access request regarding our family and I contacted the Secretary of State for Health in Scotland, Shona Robson. I then got a spin doctor for NHS Grampian right back to me, over three pages of absolute nonsense and air. But the summary of it was, yes, Phyllis Martin did write a report about you, saying you were in touch with a paedophile who was your father. Parenthesis, of course, he was dead for four, nearly five years. <laughs> However, it's not her fault that she wrote this because Police Scotland demanded the report or solicited the report from her. So their justification for a and, massively and you, ha- you have that in writing? I have that in writing. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll pick this story up again for the next the next part of it. Um, because we've now got your children are seized and, and obviously the first the first priority is, is, is to get them returned. But there's another element here where your mental health has been questioned and, and, and that becomes a theme as well. So uh, we'll pause for a moment and then we'll pick that up uh, just shortly. Thanks. That ends part three of David Scott's extraordinary interview with Brian and Janice Doherty. And what have we heard? We've heard that parents who do the right thing and report a man for trying to buy their son uh, to abuse him for sex are then hounded by the police, the authorities, social services. They're tracked across country borders. This is a conspiracy And it is a dangerous conspiracy, which is very real in Britain and, as we now know, Ireland in 2016. Look out for the next part of Dispatches from the Front, which is part four of this amazing interview. Thank you.